Uh, instead, I'll just introduce us real, very briefly. Um, so I'm joined by Michael Becker, who is a visiting assistant professor of history at Bates College, where he teaches courses on the African diaspora in the Atlantic world. He's working on a history of slavery, abolition, and survival politics in 18th and 19th century Jamaica. And I am Michael Wright. Right now, I am a visiting assistant at Boise State University. But January 1st, I, I start a full-time um, position at Lincoln University. I focus on Puerto Rican responses to colonialism, inter-American relations, and U.S. military occupations in the 20th century. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, silences in the historical record, both in terms of historiography and the archives. Um, Dr. Becker, you want to? Uh, thank you for the introduction, Micah. Um, uh, like many other folks uh, at this conference, um, uh, COVID has put a, a, a bit of a dent uh, in the, the research process and in the plans for this paper. Um, I initially proposed this for the 2019 uh, Memphis conference. Uh, assuming that I would have the opportunity to return to the Jamaican archives um, and um, uh, present some some work on on the basis of of that, um, what I'm going to do instead um, is uh, give you um, sort of a um, a big picture take of why I think we need to be talking much more about the political economy of a debt and its direct impact on enslaved people and how that's shaping enslaved people's um, lived experiences, uh, horizon for struggle, um, and uh, tells us a lot about the changing social and political landscape of early 19th century Jamaica. Um, so um, what I'm working through is um, uh, thus largely on the backbone um, of a lot of uh, marginalia, contemporary written accounts, uh, newspapers, uh, government records. Um, so it draws a lot on prior uh, Jamaican archival work, but not uh, quite the, the source base I anticipated. Um, so with, with that said as a stipulation, um, let's get started. Um, in 1802, uh, enslaver and planter uh, William Hugh Gallimore uh, fell into debt, and uh, his creditors filed suit against him in Jamaica's Chancery Court. Um, after a prolonged suit, um, a writ was forced to issue the sale of Gallimore's property uh, to compel um, the sale of enough goods and chattel until his creditors could be made whole. Um, as in the case of many other free Jamaicans, um, much of Gallimore's most valuable and portable property was in enslaved people. And so uh, when Joseph Dumford, a white man working for the deputy provost marshal came to call, um, the property he walked away with was several enslaved people. Um, at least we intended uh, to sell that property uh, to fulfill uh, Gallimore's debt obligations. Um, Joe had a very different idea. Uh, Joe was an enslaved man. Uh, we don't know uh, very much about Joe, uh, except that when um, several of his enslaved neighbors uh, were in the process of being seized to fulfill their enslaver's debt, Joe took it personally. Uh, Joe intervened with a gun, um, uh, shot and wounded Dumford, and rescued uh, the several enslaved people uh, that uh, uh, Dumford intended to walk away with. Um, and I, I, I started with Joe, his gun, and uh, this encounter between uh, law enforcement um, the debt collector, essentially, and an enslaved man um, who wouldn't let his neighbors uh, be sold. 
um, because I think it uh, points to a big silence in what has in many other respects been a very prominent part of the uh, historiography of the Caribbean, of the plantation complex, of this uh, half century before uh, full freedom. Um, so let's start with what we know. Debt and credit were the motors that ran most plantation societies. And plantation agriculture was a business filled with high risks and high rewards for enslavers and their investors. Um, almost uh, the almost constant trope of, of the West Indian planter uh, is of being land rich, rich and cash poor, dependent on running tabs of metropolitan factors, leveraging uh, for credit against the next season's crop. And it becomes almost a, um, over, uh, a running trope um, in uh, contemporary fiction, uh, news accounts, etc., cetera, um, that uh, one has to be a gambling person uh, to be engaged in the um, West Indian sugar economy um, because um, for any, any number of reasons, whether that be a uh, hurricane, uh, insurrection by enslaved people, uh, drought, um, uh, seizure by uh, seizure of cargo by pirates, um, a particular crop uh, may not make it or may not yield the suspected uh, dividends. Um, and so uh, debt um, and how it gets satisfied is crucially important. Um, this argument also sits at the um, at the center of many of the uh, ongoing conversations in this geography, going back uh, to the early 20th century, um, where the scholarship of Lowell Raggetts and Eric Williams uh, pointed to um, a decline in planters' fortunes following the Seven Years' War, exacerbated by the American Revolution, um, uh, driven to the, the death knell. Uh, by the repeal of protectionist policies, the end of the transatlantic slave trade, and uh, rising competition through the second slavery, um, and uh, quote unquote free trade uh, from sugar production in South Asia, uh, to even the, the countervailing perspective by folks like Cy Drescher, uh, who um, argue for um, a less materialistic more humanitarian-driven vision of abolitionism, but still can't escape the ever-present shadow of debt. Um, and we see this uh, trend uh, coming up in some of the more recent scholarship about the political economy of plantations uh, from folks like Veron Satchel, Dave Goss, Kathleen Monteith, David Beck Ryden, Selwyn Carrington, um, and uh, showing up in more um, social political history scholarship uh, from Diana Patton's uh, work on New Bond, the, New Bond but the Law, um, uh, Sasha Turner's fantastic work. Um, you know, the, the, the debt is always present, uh, but um, it becomes something we think about uh, more often thinking about the uh, political economy of the plantation, in thinking about uh, the uh, political debates about amelioration and abolitionism, um, we're still at a point where um, we we haven't talked full on, uh, with a, maybe a handful of exceptions, about the direct experience, direct consequences of planter and slaver indebtedness for enslaved people. Um, uh, the one uh, major exception that comes to mind for me uh, is Nicholas Crawford's work on the political economy of provisioning. Uh, but even so, I think there's a lot more to be done here. Um, I would say that one of the, um, so what I initially intended to do um, 
what I can tell you from prior uh, archival trips to Jamaica, uh, that the archives in Spanish town hold a rich collection of records from the provost marshal's office. And this is the, the individual that uh, executed um, uh, debt, um, that was basically a debt collector, um, would be responsible for selling at auction uh, goods, including uh, in uh, large quantities enslaved people for payment of debt. Uh, and in conjunction with that, uh, looking at chancery court exhibits um, and the, the property records, it's possible often to tra trace the indebtedness and forfeit of individual enslavers. And through reading those records against the grain, uh, tell a specific story about enslaved people's experiences of the social transformation. Like I said, pandemic has meant um, that I, I, I haven't been able to make it back to Spanish town to do that. Um, but I do think there's some very suggestive questions that I can raise through a lot of the other records I've looked at. Um, so it is most basic uh, debt meant budget cuts uh, for enslavers and efforts to economize and limit expenses. We know that um, for many enslavers, the well being um, and the livelihood of enslaved people was at best a tertiary concern. Uh, enslaved people's lives were seen as highly fungible. Um, what that means directly uh, for the lives of enslaved people. Because on one hand, um, uh, increased cutback on uh, whatever uh, rations or food supply the planter previously provided, <coughs> cutback on clothing alliances, uh, restraining spending on uh, the occasional uh, uh, holiday. Um, it also uh, impacts in um, less direct ways whatever labor-saving machinery might be under consideration would not get bought, worn tools would not be replaced, uh, back-breaking labor that might otherwise be outsourced uh, to a jobbing gang, a group of enslaved people uh, hired out uh, to do particularly back-breaking or menial work um, in an effort to preserve uh, investment in their own labor force. Um, it also often propels efforts to extract more labor with less manpower. Um, desperate to staunch their bleeding budgets, enslavers pushed enslaved people to work longer hours, plant and harvest larger crops, extract more labor from already stressed and strained bodies. Um, and this, um, a perfect example of this dynamic at play, uh, comes. Um, from uh, the the um, what's the word of it? Um, the Bowen Hall papers at Princeton uh, University, uh, where we see um, John Bowen, uh, the enslaver and planter, in a, a continued exchange with his plantation attorneys, overseers, and other agents, uh, urging them to uh, cut back further on rations. Um, to uh, he he had been uh, providing um, prepared meals for infants and young children under the age of six. He says, you know, we're in dire uh, economic straits. Get rid of all of that. Force enslaved people to feed their own children through what they grow on the provision grounds. Um, he had been considering uh, adopting uh, a water wheel. Um, uh, as a means to power a sugar mill. He opts not to do that um, uh, when uh, his financial situation becomes tighter. Um, there And there are many stories too about, um, you know, if we think about plantation slavery as um, uh, heavily shaped and conditioned around violence, um, and its threat, but also shaped by efforts of enslavers um, to, under coercion, uh, get some some degree of um, you know foster div divide and conquer among enslaved people, 
uh, foster uh, some degree of buy-in uh, through promising uh, particular favors, through uh, offering some opportunity of greater mobility, of um, a nicer house, uh, better rations, uh, other kinds of, of efforts to curry favoritism. Um, in the context of debt, uh, in the context of a struggle for financial fortitude, uh, many enslavers are immediately cutting back on that. And so um, in that moment, you see enslaved people who had um, struggled and contested and made a, a, um, a variety of different power plays from uh, exerting temporary absences, uh, working at uh, slower rates, um, work stoppages, uh, disappearing from plantations to force the firing of a particularly a uh, cruel overseer. Um, many of these sorts of concessions uh, are getting pulled back. Uh, and so that creates uh, a very different kind of political dynamic that enslavers have to navigate on a particular state. Um, another aspect of this uh, contestation around debt uh, comes up in what enslavers do um, if they think, if they know that the um, provost marshal or one of his agents is coming to collect. Um, Edward Long, in his 70, 1773 magnum opus, uh, describes the enslaved uh, indebted planters forming their home into a fortress, arming enslaved people with guns and farm implements to stand watch at his gates and prevent the marshal from coming to serve a writ. And while um, I haven't come across in the um, some of the records I've looked at an explicit description of that, we do have other records uh, describing um, uh, enslavers arming enslaved people um, to put off land speculators or to uh, keep a neighbor from encroaching on their property line. And uh, what comes from that? Um, suggests very much that this could be uh, in the in the form of a protracted siege. Uh, we could be talking about um, uh, uh, enslavers um, sort of hunkering down on a on a particular piece of property, um, and so that could be a, a almost a. Um, an ongoing uh, skirmish uh, for um, armed enslaved people. Um, this also comes up a lot in the discussion about um, in the later days of amelioration, especially the missionaries are taking uh, up steam, um, enslaved people um, uh, as market days uh, being um, moved to a Saturday. Um, and Jamaican law has carved out an exception specifically around debt um, so that if enslaved people are off their estate on a Sunday, they cannot be seized by the provost marshal. Whereas if they're off on a state on any other day of the week, they can be seized. And so there's extensive debate in the Jamaican assembly, uh, in uh, parliamentary committees, and uh, in Jamaican newspapers about. Um, what this potential move for a sun from a Saturday to a sun from a excuse me from a Sunday to a Saturday might mean for seizure for debt, but also for the the, um, the liveliness of markets, um, uh, which were a source not only for enslaved people to try to build up some uh, meager savings um, to potentially uh, at some long future date purchase their freedom. Uh, but also a place of socialization and a place where many people, free and enslaved, are uh, getting their their uh, food supply or purchasing cloth uh, and engaging in, in many other day-to-day um, -day, uh, commerce. Um, so I, I feel like I'm uh, starting to... Um, 
um, get short on time, so I'm going to um, uh, cut ahead a bit. Um, in the instance that an enslaved person were sold for, were seized by the provost marshal, they would often be incarcerated in the parish workhouse. Since the provost marshal conducted the vendue only three times a year at the time of the, of the uh, parish court, uh, which would be quartered sessions, uh, slave court, um, sometimes common claims, meeting all at the same time, um, enslaved people could be incarcerated in the workhouse uh, for um, four to five months uh, awaiting uh, that sale day. Um, and then um, the moment of sale itself coinciding with the court day would be um, a day when uh, folks free and enslaved from around the parish uh, would appear in the courthouse town. Um, and this means it would be both an extremely public event as well as um, uh, one happening uh, within earshot of uh, judges and magistrates going about their business of hearing cases and passing sentences. Um, to be uh, taken away, to be sold away uh, in the midst of a debt, I think has uh, very significant consequences for the politics and the social and cultural lives of enslaved people. Um, we can assume that in most cases, um, sellers were also within the same parish. That doesn't mean it, it, that um, they're necessarily neighbors or particularly close. Um, and so uh, being sold meant an enslaved person would be removed from a community, sometimes from family. Um, while um, amelioration is pushed very hard, to make it difficult to, to not sell a family as a unit, we also know that how family would be recognized by the courts, by the provost marshal, uh, often didn't map onto enslaved people's own understanding of their uh, network of relations, as that could include um, uh, people who weren't necessarily biological relatives, uh, but fit within the fictive kinship, of shipmates, of people who had shared uh, an estate uh, for a long period of time. Um, it also meant being sold away from, in many cases, uh, a dwelling they built with their own hands, provision grounds they may have cultivated for generations. Um, it often also meant, at least according to contemporaries, and I, I think that they're needs to be more work in the property records to really flesh out whether this is completely accurate. But the narrative among uh, enslavers and the contemporary Jamaican newspapers is that enslaved people are often being sold away in these debt situations from um, uh, small households uh, to uh, larger estates. And that often meant transition from um, working as domestic servants, uh, working on coffee, uh, indigo plantations, to increasingly sugar. Um, and we see um, many discussions of enslaved people uh, trying to uh, navigate in these auction spaces who their enslaver, who their new enslaver will be. Um, uh, making threats to enslavers that have a reputation for being particularly harsh or brutal, uh, telling them they won't uh, work for them, uh, telling them they would rather um, uh, kill themselves. Um, uh, we also, uh, in uh, one rare set of letters that survives from a provost marshal in the 1820s, uh, there is a very prolonged exchange uh, between the provost marshal, deputy provost marshal rather, and a free man of color who's recently managed to purchase his own freedom, who knows that his enslaver is in debt, has been trying to get that enslaver to allow him 
to buy his family from them has not succeeded and is now trying to lobby the provost marshal uh, to get um, some advanced information about what the selling price might be, trying to figure out if there's a way to gain the auction so that he can uh, have some assurance that he'll be able to um, reunite with his family. Uh, and the provost marshal, at least in his engagement with this particular uh, man, um, uh, is trying to offer some um, some assurances that he'll try to do what he can um, and offering uh, advice as to what the selling price could potentially be and how uh, this man and his community uh, could try to uh, prepare and gather the funds necessary to make a winning bid. Um, what I'll also say um, is that uh, in many cases, um, this long period between um, being, being seized for a debt, um, being sold at auction, and finally being conveyed to the purchaser, which often doesn't happen immediately, um, is accompanied by uh, enslaved people trying to stake out for themselves, trying to um, uh, take flight. Um, one, uh, one example of this comes from uh, the Kingston newspaper, the Daily Advertiser. Um, uh, um, two enslaved women, um, Lucy, uh, who uh, is described in the advertisement um, as having her country marks on her face um, and, and carrying away uh, her infant child with her, uh, as well as Mary, um, described as being about 40 and of the Mandingo country, also wearing her country marks and known as a Higgler or uh, a woman um, engaged in um, intercolonial trade, traveling frequently throughout Jamaica, uh, selling markets, um, each running away at about the same time. There's the implication that they um, uh, ran from the workhouse together. Um, and uh, six months later, uh, in December of 1790, um, the, indiv the individuals that bought them at auction are still advertising for their capture. Um, so we can, so we can uh, take some comfort in thinking that perhaps in this space where these two enslaved women um, have uh, charted out uh, a path of their own, have tried to find a life of freedom in the midst of this context, that that's, pos that that's possible. Um, and so I'll conclude by saying, you know, I, I think we really need to be thinking a lot more about the, co the combination of this political economy bit and this political and this, um, the politics of enslaved people bit. Um, I think this economic transformation that we've been talking about for a long time, this consolidation of power and capital in the planter class, how in the, in the, among the uh, plantocracy, the, the really elite large sugar makers, um, and um, the indebtedness of smaller scale enslavers is also really shaking up the social and political landscape for enslaved people. And there are the records to do this work. Uh, it requires reading against the grain. It requires uh, working with this, this, um, these property data sets that we've often seen as very dull, uh, but that I think uh, really help uh, enliven uh, our understanding of, of this really important experience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Becker. Um, there's no way to applaud, but so I'll just give you a little. Um, all right. Um, so from there, I want to turn to 20th century Puerto Rico. Um, and specifically, this is my first foray into my second major project. My dissertation examined um, Puerto Rican participation in the U.S. military occupations around the Circum-Caribbean and what that meant for the development of Puerto Rican nationalism and inter-American relations. 
And here, I really want to drill down on um, some of these men, their careers, their ideology, and what they um, understood to be Puerto Rican and American. And uh, in this paper, I'm focusing particularly on Pedro Pete del Valle, in large part just because he was uh, famous and because he had a really colorful career. He spent most of his early career serving as something of an imperial troubleshooter throughout the Circum Caribbean. Um, he was much prized as a translator and sort of a, what I call spokesman for empire. He, for example, served as the inspector general for the gendarme in Haiti. Um, he served two tours in Nicaragua um, during the Sandino uprising. Um, and he also wrote the attack plan for the United States uh, invasion of Santo Domingo in 1916. Uh, thereafter, he was uh, sent to Rome, and he was the naval observer with the Italian military during the invasion of Ethiopia. He became a World War II hero for his service in the Pacific Theater and the first Hispanic to reach the rank of lieutenant general. So for de decades, Del Valle was this really well-known figure in Puerto Rico. He was kind of the, the prodigal son whose accomplishments reflected upon the island's worth and, and fitness for U.S. citizenship and self-government. According to the pro-statehood magazine El Estado Puerto Rico, Del Valle's success was, quote, a source of pride for the Puerto Ricans as he returned to the island with the honors which all heroes conquer for the good name of the land of his birth. But despite his accomplishments and his fame, Del Valle has been more or less written out of Puerto Rican history since his death in 1978. And this is fairly surprising given how many pages have been devoted to Puerto Ricans' military service um, and the careers of prominent representatives of the patria. David Killingray once noted that scholars seemed reluctant to examine the role played by African soldiers in the violence of European colonialism. And I think likewise, historians of Puerto Rico have been reticent to explore the careers of men like Del Valle, who embraced Americanization and U.S. empire. And that aversion is certainly understandable after five centuries of colonialism. And Del Valle is an extreme case. Uh, his career after retirement, including his turn to the far right, his really explicit racism, and calls for, quote, the benevolent domination of the world by the United States, make him a pretty unlikely subject for nationalist historians. But I think that this silence has reinforced a kind of tired paradigm of resistance and accommodation and really obscured the complexities of the negotiations surrounding Americanization, as well as the influence of subject peoples on domestic politics. So this is a biographical. I'm using Del Valle's career as a lens through which to explore alternative responses to colonialism that really haven't been included in the literature. So soon after the Treaty of Paris granted Washington sovereignty over the island, US officials began to imagine Puerto Rico and its, and its inhabitants as these valuable intermediaries who were destined to contribute to America's growing dominance in the region. Thus, the Bureau of Insular Affairs, which was uh, more or less a de facto colonial office in the War Department, and administrators on the ground embarked on a really ambitious program of an Americanization and militarization that was meant to transform Puerto Ricans into loyal subjects who were both supportive of the United States, but also willing to serve it, particularly abroad. In addition to the Puerto Rico Regiment, which was permanently stationed on the island, um, they also created an insular police force, which was a paramilitary organization designed to guard against labor militancy. Uh, this also extended to the schools. By 1911, there were more than a thousand high school students who were organized into special student companies where they received instruction in drill and ceremony and were furnished with U.S. Army equipment. Um, and these service members were important as uh, symbols of loyalty to the United States. Um, both members of the student companies and the Puerto Rico Regiment were incorporated into the, the rituals of colonial rule, um, parades and public ceremonies and concerts. From the officers who served as the head of municipal governments to the public health campaigns that were organized by army doctors, uh, 
Militarization both reinforced U.S. rule and prepared Puerto Ricans for their unique role in America's growing empire. And especially after 1904, um, when the War Department started to replace junior officers from the continent with Islanders, U.S. military service also helped secure legitimacy for the colonial regime by providing a respectable livelihood to the sons of the island's elites. And this was particularly important because Puerto Ricans had been more or less shut out of military service since a failed uh, revolution against Spain known as the Grito de la Reyes. So mobilization served as reassurance that U.S. colonialism represented a more liberal relationship um, between the island and its metropole. From the outset, insular officials looked upon the military as an instrument of Americanization and uplift. Uh, according to Leo Stanton Rowe, who would go on to become chief of the State Department's Latin American Affairs Division, recruitment presented an opportunity to address what he considered the, the grave shortcomings of a tropical mixed race people. Um, and very often this is framed in the literature as an imposition by the metropole on sort of a benighted colonial people. But I think what's often forgotten is how many of the island's elites agreed with U.S. officials' assessment of the popular classes and at least tacitly approved of the racial assumptions that undergirded that evaluation. They also shared a faith in the military as a school for responsible citizenship. So even advocates of independence who wanted an independent Puerto Rico supported recruitment as a means to prepare the population who were imagined as um, ignorant and backwards after centuries of Spanish exploitation to govern themselves. Um, so aspiring officers and their patrons basically inundated the governor's office and the War Department with solicitations for commissions. In 1903, Luis Fabres wrote to resident commissioner Federico de Guetau, all but demanding that he be selected for West Point, promising that a number of prominent politicians of my party will also write you. Similarly, um, a man named E. Orutia requested that Governor Hunt re recommend his son for an appointment, noting that his family was one of the oldest in Puerto Rico. Over time, these officers, both those serving on the regiment on the island and those who received appointments to mainland academies came to represent many of the most prestigious families on the island. So Luis Raul Esteves, the, the first Puerto Rican graduate from West Point, was the son of the former mayor of Aguadilla. And both sons of the famous Puerto Rican patriot Eugenio Maria de Hostus received commissions in the Puerto Rico regiment. Thanks to the co-option of much of the political elite, as well as Puerto Ricans' generally favorable view of the military, recruitment soon produced a cadre of career officers who had proven their loyalty uh, and their ability to represent the United States abroad. So in the following decades, these men would be posted throughout the Circum Caribbean and participate in nearly every U.S. intervention of the Wilsonian era. So the main subject of this paper, Pedro Pete Del Valle, is one example. He was born in 1893 to a really prominent family whose patriarch somewhat embodied Puerto Rican elite's paternal concern for the masses. Uh, Francisco Del Valle Atiles had studied in Spain and France, and he received his medical degree in Seville. And then he returned to Puerto Rico, where he was active in local politics, particularly with the Orthodox Autonomous Party, and then its successor, the Republican Party of Puerto Rico. He also published an award-winning treatise on the condition of the island's campesinos, which he sought, you know, which sought to contribute to their physical, intellectual, and moral improvement. So in 1893, he was appointed mayor of San Juan, a post that he would later occupy in 1907. And like most of his political party, the elder Del Valle was an ardent supporter of U.S. rule, and he was willing to accept tutelage in exchange for eventual citizenship and statehood. As such, he proved integral to the U.S. military regime that ruled the island until 1900, uh, he served in all kinds of different positions, uh, Secretary of the uh, Interior, Chairman of the Island's Board of Charities, etc. 
And because of this cooperation with the regime and his place in the island social hierarchy, he was able to ensure that his children's education would prepare them for life under U.S. rule. Pedro and his brother attended an English language kindergarten. Uh, thereafter, heeding the advice of a family friend, a German professor, the family moved to Baltimore, where they enrolled in public school and, quote, learned to be Americans. Um, he returned briefly to Puerto Rico when he was 12, and then both boys were sent away to Mercer Berg Academy in Pennsylvania. And throughout all of this, his father's connections were really integral to Pedro's career. Originally, he was going to be an engineer, and he got accepted to Cornell, um, but he was really proud to be descended from a long line of Spanish officers, and he wanted to pursue a commission. So, and apparently without any prior appointment, his father took him to El Moro to speak with the commanding army officer, and then to the Navy yard to speak to the ranking naval officer, and then they finally popped into the governor's office to meet with Governor George Colton who suggested that he enter the Naval Academy. Soon after, his father secured him a tutor in Annapolis who specialized in the Academy's entrance exams. And Pedro was sworn in as a midshipman in 1910. And he had a really, um, a pretty undistinguished career at the Naval Academy. He graduated in 1915 towards the bottom of his class. But during his time there, he met his wife, Catherine, who was the daughter of Commodore Valentine Nelson, who had distinguished himself during the Battle of Manila Bay. He also took on the nickname Pete, which he would use selectively, particularly when addressing um, conservative and right-wing Anglo-Saxon audiences for the rest of his life. So in other words, Davai unreservedly embraced an American identity, which when combined with his father's connections, allowed him to rise above the limits that many Puerto Ricans experienced because of their colonial origin. And Pete also embraced his role as an imperial troubleshooter. Um, his early career, like I said, was spent largely in the Circum Caribbean. Um, thanks to his Spanish proficiency and assumed familiarity with Latin cultural norms, he was much in demand as an interpreter and a trainer for the constabulary forces that the United States organized throughout the region. He joined the 1st Brigade in Haiti, where he served as the assistant administrator in Port-au-Prince. And it's pretty clear from his writings that he shared his um, North American comrade sort of sense of identity and particularly of racial superiority. You know, in addition to the kind of obligatory denunciations of voodoo, he also recalled how he had hired a Haitian helper that he nicknamed Smell Bad. Um, and from there, he was assigned to the Dominican Republic in order to draft the order for the assault on Santo Domingo and served as a personal translator for Rear Admiral William Banks Caperton. Before departing, he also translated Admiral Harry Knapp's proclamation establishing a U.S. military government. So after some brief tours uh, at sea in Marine Corps headquarters, he returned to the outposts of American empire in the 1920s. In 1923, he acted as General Pendleton's aide-de-camp during an inspection tour of the West Indies. He was back in Haiti in 1926, uh, where he remained for a couple years, serving as the Inspector Gender, uh, General of the Gendarme, in addition to playing golf and polo at the American Club. In the early 1930s, he twice joined missions in Nicaragua, and there he ensured that U.S.-sponsored elections took place, um, largely by threatening civilian dissidents and politicians alike. For example, uh, in this one instance, he pointed two machine guns at a political club in Chantales and informed them that if there was going to be any unrest, they would spray the club first. In a letter to Spiro Agnew decades later, in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination, he explained that while in Nicaragua, he had routinely ordered his men to shoot first and ask questions later. And then he opined that police should follow suit when encountering African-American protesters. So for Del Valle, a shared language and, and a familiarity with cultural norms didn't really engender sympathy for local nationals. Instead, his identity as a white American and a Marine trumped any notions of pan-Latin solidarity. 
So thereafter, he was with the Special Service Squadron in 1933, where he traveled to Cuba to help derail what he later described as a communist plot orchestrated by, as far as I can tell, the Soviet Union, Mexico, the State Department, and and the press, all of whom were controlled by quote-unquote Zionist Jews to install Fulgencio Batista as president. But with the good neighbor policy, Del Valle's kind of specialty became obsolete. And instead, he found himself serving as uh, assistant naval attache in Rome and accompanying Italian forces during the invasion of Ethiopia. In a later volume dedicated to his observations and in his memoirs, Del Valle really expressed admiration for uh, Italy for conquering an empire, and especially for the black shirt division and Benito Mussolini. This would seem to be the genesis of his later infatuation with authoritarian regimes, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. By 1964, he was willing to suggest a coup d'etat in the United States, such as our Latin American neighbors have used lately in Santo Domingo, Peru, Brazil, and Argentina to toss out red and pro-red governments. So after Italy, Del Valle was confined to Marine Corps headquarters for several years until World War II. As commander of the 11th Marine Regiment on Guadalcanal and commanding general of the 1st Marine Division on Okinawa, he earned a really sterling reputation and all kinds of medals, including the Distinguished Service Medal and the Legion of Merit. So he emerged from the war a hero and lauded in the mainland press, and eagerly sought after to give speeches and remarks. But already his politics had begun to kind of fall out of favor in Washington. Before the 11th Marine Regiment left for Guadalcanal, Del Valle faced a court of inquiry for criticizing President Roosevelt. And while he would later maintain that his retirement from the Marine Corps in 1946 was motivated by his finances, it seems pretty clear that political considerations at least eased the, the decision. After retiring from the Marine Corps, um, a lot of people assumed that he would take over the governorship of Puerto Rico from New Deal stalwart Rex Tugwell. But unsurprisingly, given his track record, President Truman declined to nominate him. So instead, he took a lucrative position with the International Telephone and Telegraph Company, first in the Middle East and then later in Argentina. But that second career would end abruptly in 1952 after he penned an open letter to President Truman accusing his administration of collaborating with the Soviet Union and allowing American sovereignty to be undermined by a commitment to the United States, which, quote, serves chiefly as a means of confusing our national patriotism and watering it with communistic internationalism. So this letter circulated in the mainland press. It was read into the congressional record. And soon after, ITT, which obviously did a lot of business with the government, informed him that he would no longer have a job, um, something that Del Valle attributed to his daring to point the finger at Truman's Jewish advisors. Um, Undaunted, Del Valle returned to Maryland where he and his wife owned a, a country estate. And in 1954, he decided to run in the Republican primaries in Maryland, running on a platform of states' rights and governmental economy and a really uncritical embrace of Senator Joseph McCarthy, Del Valle finished a distant fourth, garnering less than 5,000 votes. But rather than admit defeat, this just served as evidence that the United States had been infiltrated by communists and leftists and liberals. The year prior, Del Valle and other disillusioned veterans had founded a right-wing nationalist organization dubbed the Defenders of the American Constitution. So after his defeat, the organization deemed both parties hopelessly corrupt and signed on to a failed McCarthy-backed attempt to form a third party for the 1956 elections. Hiring a publisher, they also opened an office in Ormond Beach, Florida, where they produced a monthly news sheet, Alert, and a bi-monthly paper, Task Force, both dedicated to warning citizens of plots to, quote, endanger the security of the nation under God and subverted citizens to the authority of a world slave state under the Antichrist. And the uh, one sort of scholarly treatment that I can find about Del Valle um, argues that this kind of provides a a window into his paranoid political personality. In fact, he is compared with the character of um, the mad general in Dr. Strangelove, which is 
somewhat fitting. But, you know, it's, it's tempting to dismiss Del Valle as a paranoiac with delusions of grandeur. In the 60s and 70s, he was connected to an array of hate groups, and he deemed pretty much every conspiracy theory and culture war issue not only real, but a really imminent threat to the nation. He was incensed by integration, particularly in the service academies, uh, and he also subsidized a paid intelligence agent named Frank Kappel, who reported, amongst other improbable stories that one of Winston Churchill's daughters was uh, a practicing lesbian who gave an exhibition before a group of approximately 100 using a 21-year-old Negro girl. He regularly exchanged letters with members of the KKK as well as neo-Nazis. He addressed conspiratorial literature to the private residents of the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and eventually he advocated a military takeover of the U.S. Capitol. Like I say, he seemed particularly vexed by issues of race and civil rights, um, particularly when they touched upon his own identity. Uh, he would eventually describe himself as a white American Christian in just about every letter he wrote. Uh, and he once demanded that a fellow patriotic publication stop using a picture that made him appear too dark skinned, lest he be accused of being a secret agent of the NAACP. So though Americanization had allowed him to overcome his colonial origins, his white American Christian identity seems to have been kind of a fragile one. So if Del Valle was an example of the lunatic fringe, he wasn't as isolated as that characterization suggests. Um, his publications only attracted about 5,000 subscribers, but his writings were reprinted in a whole bunch of right-wing publications. He was also a member of the John Birch Society, was influential in Curtis Dahl's Liberty Lobby, um, conspired with Waldo Butterworth to form the Christian Soldiers. He advised a number of different uh, Minuteman-style militias about what weapons they should buy to prepare for a uh, government overthrow. He headed the United Congressional Appeal. And while Puerto Rican historians may have overlooked him, he never forgot his ties to the island regularly visiting and commenting upon social and political conditions there. So I'll just kind of end by summarizing why I think Del Valle's career is important. You know, it bears very little resemblance to those of the pro-independence activists and the autonomistas so well represented on the literature in Puerto Rican identity and nationalism. And it's not really difficult to grasp why those who have been suffering under colonialism and racial discrimination have been reluctant to study the story of a prominent Puerto Rican guilty of inflicting those same burdens on others. But while Davai might be an extreme case, he really wasn't unique in his embrace of this white Christian American identity and support for U.S. empire. And I think that the failure to engage with these men's stories and their visions of national belonging has obscured the complexities of Puerto Rican responses to empire, and particularly their pivotal role in expanding that empire abroad. Thank you. All right, so we have no designated commentator, so we're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience. Um, although I, I seem unable to find the, the chat function that I just saw. At, at, at this point, I ah, here we go. Uh, don't see any any questions in the chat. I, I think I'm still figuring out this platform, but I think that probably the, the chat box is the place to. Oh, looks um, like we, we have Hogarth. one from Professor Hogarth here. Um, so we can, can give them a moment to uh, compose their question. And uh, if anybody else has a question, there is a, a tab here that's uh, for the Q&A. <laughs> that's all right, Dr. Hogarth. Uh, both our presentations were long. We were down to two, so we took advantage. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that's a, a question for me. Yes. Um, 
Uh, so I think it's a fantastic question. Um, I am, um, that's definitely an avenue I'd like to um, explore uh, further uh, in terms of, of looking at um, uh, how, um, how enslavers' debt uh, impacts uh, mortality of enslaved people, illnesses, feigned illnesses, um, or questions of autonomy, uh, resistance running away. Um, I think all of those are questions that it's possible to get at to some extent from the records that that are that are there. Um, at at this point, I I don't know that I I feel um, confident enough to to um, offer a strong hypothesis um, of of what uh, what direction that would go. I mean, I I I certainly think that. Um, the the instability and pressures created um, through planter indebtedness um, uh, does both constrain some avenues of um, of redress and you know partial uh, bargaining uh, accommodation, um, but I. Um, I think, um, and I and I I certainly think that some of the limited work that's uh, been done on how, um, for example, I, I think very much of, of Nick Crawford's work uh, in this regard, uh, thinking about um, how enslavers cutting back on provisions, um, on provisions that they are directly funding. Uh, creates um, uh, increased mortality, uh, um, even as it also uh, sparks enslaved people to um, put greater effort and uh, try to carve away more time to work provision grounds and uh, in process uh, neglect the enslavers uh, crop. Um, Uh, I am unfortunately not familiar with uh, Natalie Davis's fictions in the archive. Um, I have heard tremendous things about it. I, I very much regret I can't address that, that question more specifically. Um, I, I, I think um, I think the um, the question of you know what kind of uh, contextual understanding um, um, combined with um, uh, you know taking what taking what we know uh, in the kinds of um, group biographies you know I, I don't know for example how much I can find out specifically about Joe as an individual outside of the the few lines in the St. Anne Vestry minutes, um, offering a reward for his capture. Uh, but I, I think there's um, a lot I would be able to find out about, um, you know, what's happening uh, in Joe's uh, circumstances, uh, what's happening uh, on the, the uh, surrounding estates, you know, what might be, um, yeah, I mean, in, in I'm I feel like I'm kind of rambling right now. the the short uh, The short answer is um, fantastic uh, uh, um, questions. Definitely an area I'm interested in digging further in. Uh, can't wait to get back to the archives and uh, try to answer these questions more fully. I think we're all dying to get back to the archives. Please.
Yeah, so the demographics of the island uh, were a subject of some debate at the time. So uh, many U.S. officials were really kind of invested in Puerto Ricans as uh, sort of a model colonial people, you know, who could be these kind of like interlocutors and spokesmen for empire. Um, and you can read about that, like in the work of Lanny Thompson. But um, because of that, they really tried to play up the whiteness of the island, even um, arguing that although it was a mixed race population, the um, the you know, the dark skin component was slowly being bred out of existence. Um, and this really didn't bear much um, relation to reality as pro-segregationist um, politicians found when they went to visit the island. So like Joseph Cannon um, toured the island in 1913. Um, and he was sort of a virulent um, segregationist and was shocked to discover how uh, dark skinned Puerto Ricans uh, really were. So it really depends on the U.S. Uh, official you're talking to and who census takers decided um, qualified as white or not, simply because of the different racial um, categories in Puerto Rico. Yeah, I think there is a sense to which this is um, a story of military careers as facilitated by whiteness, but it was also um, sort of a, a tacit, you know, concern with whitening because Puerto Ricans in the 1880s and 1890s had sort of created this mythos of the, the Gran Familia Puerto Ricana, right? Like the, the great... Um, Puerto Rican family that was supposed to be race blind, kind of like in the writings of Jose Marti. And so whiteness and improving the population were paramount in the minds of many elites, but they don't show up like in newspapers because that would be breaking the sort of unspoken vow about Puerto Rican solidarity. Um, which is a little bit different than in other places uh, around the Circum Caribbean. So um, Puerto Rican politicians never, for example, adopted um, legislation specifically to prevent non-Caucasians from immigrating, for example. Right. Does anybody else have any questions? We have a little bit of time and my students will tell you I love to hear myself talk. Um. So I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily um, attribute the quote unquote relative obscurity of our subject matters to the small attendance, unfortunately. Um, so I think, I think one, uh, bo both of us um, were loan papers that applied and were grouped together by the organizing committee. I think um, uh, while I, certainly uh, learned a lot from uh, Micah's paper and uh, hearing about his work. I, I, I think our topics are fairly different. Uh, and I think there were um, some folks who were drawn towards uh, panels that sort of had a more uh, pointed topic. I, I would also say I, I think um, online conferencing uh, has its benefits, uh, certainly uh, more environmentally friendly, um, uh, makes attendance more affordable. Uh, but um, I think it also um, really impacts, um, you know, if you travel to a conference 
it's you sort of are try to be fully present at a conference for many people. Uh, for most of us, uh, this happens in the middle of uh, a semester, just as midterms and stuff are getting graded. Um, you know, we try to carve away way time to turn to a couple panels, but we have to go on with the uh, everydayness of the, the rest of our uh, professional and personal lives. Um, yes, sorry. Agree, but I learned something. And, um, you know, I'm just uh, thrilled to be sharing some research with somebody other than undergraduates. So um, thank you, everyone who attended. Um, I think we'll, I think we're about ready to wrap this up. Any, any uh, final questions? Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Take care. All right. Michael, it was a pleasure.